Released in 2000 by Blizzard North, Diablo 2 was a behemoth of its time. With millions of active players and a thriving online community, the follow-up expansion pack Lord of Destruction took the community to a whole new level. The game was renowned for what still stands today as a best-in-class gear system, with randomised modifiers resulting in an astonishing array of GG gear, which, on top of randomised maps, provided gameplay replayability that kept the community coming back year after year, even after the novelty of the campaign story wore off. The gambling-like payoff of getting the best loot was a huge draw for the player base, and online was where it was at. Speed demons were no strangers to the game. Every few months, a new official ladder would be created on Battle.net, with players working hard to level up as fast as possible to get to the top of the ladder. And outside of the ladder competition, new players would make extensive use of rushes, where other players using higher leveled characters would play cooperatively to speed noobs through the game's content in order to help them quickly get to high levels. These rushes could often be done in under an hour, taking a player from level 1 all the way through three difficulties of five acts to the end game. With the enormous focus on the online community, the single player campaign was largely left aside by the player base. The other dominant gaming community of the time, speedrunners, were also not very interested. The degree of randomness which supported the game's extensive replayability, as well as its underlying difficulty without online assistance, left some saying to try and speedrun it would be as maddening as the dreams which haunted the Dark Wanderer himself. And so, for over a decade, Diablo speedrunning was largely left languishing. It would take a few false starts, the rise of the streaming community, and a few feisty players to show off the true capabilities of mastery in this turn of the millennium classic. So stay a while and listen, as we go through a journey covering the history of Diablo 2, Lord of Destruction Kill Bale World Records. Diablo 2 Lord of Destruction consists of 5 acts, as you journey through 5 different areas of the world of Sanctuary, powering up your character on the quest to defeat the 3 prime evils. Mephisto Lord of Hate, Diablo Lord of Terror, and Bale Lord of Destruction. Every act has multiple areas, and every area is randomly generated in order to ensure that practically every new game played will have a completely unique map, eliminating the ability for players to memorize specific paths or simply work through the game mechanically. Each character type has their own skill tree, with different magical abilities you can power up over time. These magical abilities can be directly used to attack monsters, or alternatively used to passively assist your own character's survival, boosting their movement, enabling them to attack more often, or reducing the amount of damage they take. On top of this, there's a universal stat screen, where for every time you level up you get 5 stat points to assign to your character across 4 different attributes. First is Strength, which allows the character to wear higher level gear, like a metal helm instead of a plain leather cap. Next is Dexterity. This factors into a complicated calculation of how likely you are to hit monsters, and how likely they are to hit you when using physical attacks. Then there's Vitality, which determines how much life your character has, so how much damage you can take from monsters, and also how much stamina you have, which limits how far a character can run before being forced to walk. And finally, Energy which determines how much mana a character has. Almost all spells in the game cost mana, so keeping this sustained goes a long way in fighting through the hordes of hell. Gear for your character to wear is dropped randomly throughout the game. Once equipped, this can boost either character stats or skill trees, but another key part is the character attributes that are practically hidden from the player. There are a huge amount of these, but the key ones for our purposes are resistances, hit recovery, run walk speed, and cast rate. For resistances, these come in 4 types and reduce by a percentage the amount of damage a player takes from magic attacks from enemies. For example, fire resistance reduces the damage taken from an inferno fire breath. On hit recovery, whenever a character takes enough damage in one hit, there's a chance that they will get stunned and go through a hit recovery animation. Getting faster hit recovery can shorten the time of this animation, allowing the player to keep killing their foes or simply get to safety. Run Walk Speed allows the player to travel faster, making avoiding monster mobs easier, or simply making it quicker to get from point A to point B and finish the game. On Cast Rate, every character type has different animations to cast their spells. Just like with Hit Recovery, faster Cast Rate gear can reduce the length of these animations and thus the time between spells, allowing you to escape to safety or keep killing even faster. As a final quirk to the gameplay, 
and perhaps to address some issues in the online community's use of rushes, Blizzard added a requirement that a character must be level 20 in order to proceed past a set of mini-bosses in the final act called the Ancients before facing Bale. What all of this amounts to is getting through Diablo 2 fast means managing three key things. First of all, speed of movement, just physically moving your character through from the rogue encampment at the start of the game to the Worldstone chamber at the end. Secondly, kill speed is important for getting monsters out of your way and into your experience bar. Finally, there's level management. It becomes really important to get to level 20 as quickly and efficiently as possible in order to face the final beast. In a game fused with randomness, the variability in any given playthrough's maps, gear, and ability to level is overwhelming. So much so, that if you even brought up the idea of speedrunning Diablo 2 on the Speed Demos archive forums, folks would simply point and laugh. It took four years after Diablo was first released for there to even be a mention of truly speedrunning the game in the Speed Demos archive community. Open to any possibilities for what a category could look like, but mostly premised on the idea of a team run online. Even so, it would take almost another year for anything to come to fruition. After getting involved in the discussion early, the first recorded speedrun of Diablo 2 was completed on June the 11th, 2005 by David Marshmallow Gibbons. Coming from a background of perfect dark elite speedruns and staring down the laughs from the SDA forums who put initial estimates at 7 hours, Marshmallow chose to eliminate randomness by tackling the task in a segmented manner. For those unfamiliar with the concept of segmented speedruns, I strongly recommend checking out Summoning Salt's video on Half-Life 2, which touches on segmented. But to quickly summarize, a segmented run is one which heavily relies on save files. By reloading a save file, it allows a player to retry a specific segment of a run over and over again until you've optimized it as best as possible before moving on to the next section. Past players of Diablo 2 will know that every time you exit the game, it'll save over the character file you've been playing in order to ensure any progress you've made in terms of experience, gear, or map discoveries left intact. For the purposes of Marshmallow's run, this meant that he had to make separate copies of the game's saved character files each time he was satisfied with a segment so the game wouldn't overwrite them. Then he could place this in the folder where characters are saved every time he wanted to restart a segment. This approach gave Marshmallow some huge advantages in creating a great time. First up, in speed of movement, I said earlier that maps are completely random between different characters. Key to this is that all characters are generated off a static seed number locked in place at the point of character creation. Once you start a character in single player, its maps will always generate in exactly the same way, so Marshmallow could run ahead and figure out how his map was laid out, then reset his run back to the start of the segment and know exactly where he needed to go. While it could be argued that this was akin to the much loathed third party program MapHack, the fact that Marshmallow had not used any external software and had done all the exploration himself was enough for the Speed Demos archive rules. Next on level management, throughout the game there are shrines littered across the map, giving different bonuses. Some heal you, some upgrade any gems you have in your inventory, but most critical to this run is the Experience Shrine. By clicking on an Experience Shrine, you get this white cross flag hovering above your character, indicating that for each enemy you kill, you earn an extra 50% bonus experience. Shrine positions on maps rarely change, especially in Act 1, but the type of shrine changes every time you load a character, so by reloading his character over and over, Marshmallow could efficiently level up his character as quickly as possible. Additionally, in the game there often spawn unique monsters, ordinary monsters who get a damage and life bonus, as well as rolling a randomly generated magical attribute. These unique monsters come with their own names and minion groups which give 500% experience for each member of the pack that you kill. So killing a pack of 5 monsters in a unique group is as good as killing 25 regular monsters. While Marshmallow didn't seem to be fully across the mechanics of this, in his commentary on the run he was happy to exploit it where he could, especially in the case of super unique monsters, which are uniques that are guaranteed to spawn on specific map tiles, like Bishibosh the Shaman in the Cold Plains, or Dark Elder, the zombie who spawns in some ruins in the Lost City in Act 2. By knowing where these monsters were guaranteed to spawn, he could make sure he ran to these locations and harvested all the bonus experience he could as quickly as possible. So, by settling on the segmented run playstyle, Marshmallow had tamed the beast named RNG as best he could. Next, he had to choose which class to play. Of the seven classes in Diablo 2, when thinking of the elements critical to a fast pace, as outlined earlier being speed of movement, kill speed, and level management, 
While many classes can do significant damage late game, and many have skills which boost their movement speed, two classes are a league above the rest and would come to dominate the fastest time to kill Bale in all Diablo 2 Lord of Destruction records. Assassin and Sorceress. The Sorceress is the quintessential Diablo 2 caster, with the choice of three magic type skill trees allowing her to deal lightning, cold or fire damage. Critical to her potential for speedrunning is the ability to teleport, allowing skipping past enemy groups, going through walls and over lava pits in the blink of an eye. In addition to this, at level 6 she gains the skill Static Field, which takes a quarter of an enemy's health on every attack, including bosses, which allows you to rip through even Bale in no time. Unfortunately, Teleport isn't unlocked until fairly late in her run at level 18, and the Sorceress is extremely prone to dying, as she gains the least life per stat point in vitality out of all Diablo 2 characters. On the other hand, the Assassin is an expansion-only character who, along with the Druid, was seemingly built to address player grievances about the difficulty of the original. On the damage front, an Assassin built around the Trap skill tree is extraordinarily powerful. At level 2 she unlocks a Fire Blast skill, which is able to damage multiple enemies at a time, and at level 12 she unlocks the skill Wake of Fire, which shreds through the hordes of hell while she's able to keep on running without hesitation. Finally, at level 6 she gains access to the skill Burst of Speed, which significantly boosts her running and attacking speed, giving large benefits for almost the entire duration of a playthrough. For the first ever speedrun of Diablo 2, Marshmallow went with the Assassin. By methodically working through the game, Marshmallow learned a lot, sharing with the community the insights on restarting maps for better use of shrines, hunting unique monster packs, and using a cold mercenary from Act 3 to overcome the two key monsters who are immune to his fire damage, Grand Vizier of Chaos, who guards a seal in the Chaos Sanctuary before Diablo, and Colenso the Annihilator, who leads the first wave of Bale's elite minion guard in the Throne of Destruction. He also set a precedent that was to be a key part of almost any Diablo 2 speedrun for the next decade, skipping the last two waves of Bale's minions by luring them out of the throne room and running back in to trigger progression. But even so, looking back now there were some enormous gaps, not knowing about some basic things like holding shift and clicking potions to move them into his belt, instead manually dragging them one at a time or buying potions from vendors very slowly by right-clicking, which has its own inbuilt delay in the game engine. And also, just spending time in off-piste areas like the pits in Act 1. Which even so, he was still under-leveled coming into Act 5 at only level 18, and needed to travel back to Act 3 in order to farm the experience required to get to level 20 so he could pass the Ancients mini-boss quest. Putting all this together, he finished the run in one hour, 58 minutes, 22 seconds, and after 5 years, Diablo 2 would have its first world record holder. For a month. Seeing the gauntlet cast down by Marshmallow and having the trail blazed, a new contender wanted a piece of the action and wanted to do things differently. Coming from basically nowhere, a new member of the SDA forums, Alan Psycho Burnett, stumbled across Marshmallow's recording on the recommendation of a friend and was shocked the run hadn't been completed with a sorceress. With some great tips from the SDA community, Psycho managed to optimize a few parts of the run, with much better mouse skills, and even being the first recorded runner to use the belt unequip trick for fast reloading of potions at vendors. He also managed a hidden factor in the game very well, gold. Because you're casting spells all the time in order to deal damage, mana potions are key to sustaining your ability to run through the game especially on a sorceress who uses teleport. While monsters are prone to dropping gold, these tend to come in very small amounts, say from 5 to 100, whereas by picking up items and selling them to vendors, as you progress through the game you can easily get between 1 and 10,000 gold from a single item. This plentiful gold also helps Psycho, because the sorceress can buy staves from vendors which give a boost to individual skills in her tree, giving either a boost to her damage, or allowing a use of a skill without investing any points. Relying on Charge Bolt early game, and then transitioning to the powerful Lightning skill, left him well positioned to handle normal monster mobs, especially after purchasing plus to skill staves from vendors and significantly boosting his damage output. On top of this, unlike Marshmallow, Psycho made use of mercenaries as early as Act 2, 
feeding him thawing potions to increase his cold resistance and making the usually terrifying fight with Duriel a breeze. However, with minimal faster run speed, he faced serious challenges in matching the pace on Marshmallow's assassin. An unseen time sink was the need to go back to town and run to a vendor to replenish mana potions extremely frequently, and without the faster run speed like the assassin, while also unable to teleport in town, Psycho was at a distinct disadvantage. And while damage to bosses was supposed to be a huge advantage, by only putting one point into static field, he had to be right next to the act boss when using the skill, making boss kills extremely difficult and an especially grinding part of the run. To be honest, looking back now, the run had its share of pathing problems as well, including unnecessary side quests like killing Radamant, and strange segments to assist boost his level, like exploring a dead-end corner of the Arcane Sanctuary multiple times. But eventually, after a few weeks of grinding, Psycho managed to pull through and beat Marshmallow's time with a 153.44. While there was some discussion in the forums from other interested players, no one else followed through with the challenge to the end. It was too easy to fall prey to perfectionism, and even segmented runs were still too random for most. The record stood unchallenged, holding the fastest recorded time throughout 2005, 2006, and 2007. Then, in 2008 something interesting occurred. Psycho came back. Unsatisfied with his previous attempts and lured by a bounty put up by other members of the forums, he came to tackle something much more grandiose. A 100% run all the way through hell. A 100% run as formulated within the bounty was based on the premise of completing all quests, including killing the Cow King, in each of the three difficulties. Normal, Nightmare and Hell. While a feat of its time, and laying the groundwork for what would in the future come to be known as Hell Runs, the details on these are a topic for another video. For our purposes, the main thing that this brought to the table was vastly improving Psycho's knowledge of gameplay mechanics, where and how to save time, and making the most of what had largely been written off as a distraction so far. Rune Words A key feature of the Lord of Destruction expansion to Diablo 2 was the addition of special items called runes. Rare items which much like gems in the original would add special bonuses when inserted into gear which had open sockets. Unlike gems though, these runes had another special use. Placed in the correct order into a piece of gear with the correct number of sockets, they'd form a rune word and bestow a bunch of other bonus attributes, granting anything from enhanced damage to faster run speed and even more. For his 100% run, Psycho won two specific rune words which would go on to become staples of Diablo speedrunning for more than a decade. Stealth and Leaf. The Stealth Rune Word requires a two socket chess piece of armor and is made by inserting the runes Tal and F in that order. This Rune Word grants bonuses that are a speedrunner's dream. 25% faster run speed for speeding through the maps, 25% faster hit recovery to minimize being stun locked when hit by strong enemy attacks, and 25% faster cast rate for reducing the time it takes to cast any spell, helping teleport faster, deal higher damage per second, and stick and move when attacking monsters. The Leaf Rune Word is made by inserting the runes Tear and Rowl into a two-socket staff. The Leaf Rune Word gives a huge benefit to sorceresses by adding three levels to all fire skills, as well as adding another three levels to fire Bolt, Inferno, and Warmth. These bonuses massively boosted Psycho's damage output, and the mana on Kill and Warmth especially helped him manage his unquenchable thirst for mana potions. The cold resistance was nice too, I guess. While being extremely powerful in and of themselves, Rune words also come with the advantage of rolling the same attributes every time they're made, playing another critical role in reducing the randomness that was so daunting to speedrunners in taking on Diablo 2. Now, anyone who's played Diablo 2 knows that rune drops are incredibly rare, but luckily, there's a spot very early in the game that can be exploited that almost guarantees runes. The boss of the optional quest in Act 1, the Countess. The Bathory-inspired end boss of the Forgotten Tower quest, at the bottom of a 5 level mini dungeon, the Countess has a particular property in her loot table in the Lord of Destruction expansion, a special rune drop slot that can drop runes as high as the level 19 required RAL within 15 minutes of first booting up the game. Distinct from any other monster in the game, the Countess has two separate item drop calculations. One rolls for up to 5 items to drop for the player to pick up. Another rolls for up to three runes to drop from her special table. However, much like an Ak boss, the Countess is limited to only dropping six objects. 
and because items take priority over rune drops, this means that the more items you roll, the less runes you get. So anytime the game would try to roll no item drop, it is instead commonly replaced with a random roll of a rune from a special rune list unique to the Countess. This is especially helpful in single player, as the chances of a no drop roll are much higher than when playing in a group online. With all this, it's fairly common for the Countess to drop 1-3 to three runes every time you kill her, which can be done repeatedly by save quitting the game and running to the bottom of the tower again, saving any progress in gear and experience gained along the journey. Even better for speedrunners, the chance to drop the specific Tal, Eth, Tear and Ral runes are actually fairly high, especially considering the otherwise chaotic level of randomness permeating the world of Sanctuary. With runes in hand and a course plotted, Psycho 100% of the game in 4 hours and 2 minutes, but with his appetite whetted, after a long dry spell from the world of Diablo, Psycho wanted more. On the 3rd of March 2009, Psycho set a truly ambitious target, to beat the game in under an hour. Taking all the learnings from his previous segmented runs, targeting rune words and optimizing his leveling locations, he was still committed to the Sorceress. However, a combination of the increased difficulty and time investment in theory crafting, along with the normal burdens of day-to-day -day life, meant that progress was slow. In the end, after two years of slowly chipping away at this project, Psycho would stop updating the SDA boards on his goals and strategies, and aside from two random posts in 2013, he was never heard from on the forums again. But that wasn't the end for Diablo 2 speedrunning, it was barely the start. Psycho's 100% run, and especially the YouTube videos with insightful and humorous commentary had inspired the SDA community. And it wasn't long before a new record for the normal bail kill was set by a new member to the forums, Laszlo by Manxita. Not long after the discussion started on the sub one hour run, Bimank joined the conversation with some tips, and before long he was completing his own assassin run to replace the now half decade old record set by Marshmallow and Psycho. Taking some of the low hanging fruit in playstyle, shift clicking potions, not wasting time in useless areas, and not needing to return to earlier acts due to under leveling, he made the most of the rune word strategies pioneered by Psycho, and even added his own optimizations like implementing the stealth bug which is a poorly understood mechanic obtained by inserting the runes for stealth before hitting the required level to use the runes in the game. This minor bug gives 25% faster run speed for around 30 seconds, as long as basically nothing happens to force the game to think about how your character stats should actually work. In all, these optimizations added up to nothing short of a massive time save. On July 29, 2009, Bimank loaded his run to YouTube with a final time of one hour, 15 minutes and two seconds re-establishing Assassin as the Queen of Speed in Diablo 2. Marshmallow's first Diablo 2 world record had stood for only a month before Psycho upped the standard and set a record that stood for nearly four years. How long could Bimank hold on to the record? He'd played smooth, optimized drops, and gotten a hell of a time. The members of SDA couldn't see much improvement on the Assassin, and most were banking on Psycho coming through with the goods that we'd now know would never be delivered. In the responses to Bimank's run, there were some oddly specific suggestions, and on the 9th of October, the SDA community would stumble across a video that wasn't quite ready for circulation. Coming out of nowhere, Fragfrog had broken the one hour mark, blowing expectations out of the water, and setting a record that is still on the Speed Demos archive page for Diablo 2 Lord of Destruction in 2021. In this amazing run, Fragfrog would use what would ultimately become the best-in-class practices in speedruns for the foreseeable future, almost exclusively focusing kills on unique enemy packs and resetting areas multiple times to grind experience from them, leveraging shrines to their ultimate potential. As mentioned earlier in the video, level management and getting to level 20 as fast as possible is critical in a Diablo 2 speedrun, and focusing attention on unique monster packs is a great way to assist this. Because you get 500% experience gain from each enemy in a pack surrounding a unique monster, recognizable by the designation Minion under their health bar, it's often not worth your time trying to kill any monsters other than unique packs. And by exploiting experience shrines on top of this, Fragfrog was getting as much as 750% experience for each monster he killed. For a quick example, see the start of his run. Here, he has an experience shrine as he comes across the super unique monster pack of Rakanishu. Since Rakanishu tends to spawn with around 6-7 to seven minions, 
Each time he spent around 10 seconds to kill just Rack and Issue and his minions, it was worth as much experience as he would otherwise get from 50 to 60 other monsters of the same type. While Bimank had some similar elements in his run, grinding Rack and Issue for experience for example, he had still spent a good amount of time killing non-unique packs. Fragfrog took to the next level, and by doing this repeatedly, he was at level 6 and using Burst of Speed within 4 minutes of the start of his run. For another example, by manipulating the drops from the Act 1 boss Andariel, he secured a pair of Hasaris boots with the key attribute of 20% faster run walk. This boosted his speed by a bit over 7% compared to Bimac. On top of this, there were a huge amount of micro-optimizations that helped him manage to grind through the segments more effectively. For example, getting a shrine right next to his Cold Plains waypoint. This location is the most likely to spawn experience and skill shrines, and it was much closer to the waypoint than what Bimank had, saving around 10 seconds per check on each save and quit. In areas not critical for leveling, he could keep using this shrine to generate a skill shrine to help boost his damage output against bosses and increase his run speed even further. Taking things to the next level, there were even more subtle tricks like using a dagger instead of the assassin's default weapon, enabling faster laying of traps and saving a fraction of a second every single time he attacked, as well as using gas potions against the fire immune must kill mini bosses of Grand Vizier of Chaos and Colenso the Annihilator, among a bunch of other things. In all, the run wasn't perfect, but it was close enough to deter others from thinking they could best it. Fragfrog continued to play and foster a community around getting through Diablo 2 as quickly as possible, starting an 8-man group targeting the 100% format pioneered by Psycho. Early discussions of this at SDA showed promise, but were still focused on the segmented aspect, which was hard to coordinate across 8 participants and only amplified through non-Battle.net multiplayer. Eventually, he and another key member in the discussion, MFB, would migrate across to a German-specific Diablo forum at indiablo.de to lead dedicated Battle.net ladder speedrun groups, and it was from here that the next phase in Diablo 2 speedrunning would emerge. So come back for the next video when we explore when real-time attacks.